Best of r slash malicious compliance episode 104. Subscribe for Reddit videos daily. I work in a major pizza delivery chain that has so far been unsuccessful in out pizzaing the hut. Our store is in a college town, and everyone is bored as hell right now for obvious reasons. So we've gone from maybe one prank call a day to at least three five. Which isn't much but still really annoying with how much more business we've been getting, again for obvious reasons. The worst part is how uncreative and low effort most of them are. At least 80% of them are can I get a boneless pizza, or is this a crusty crab, with the occasional insert GTA fast food order copper pasta here. This had been going on way too long so I took up the habit of just hanging up whenever someone starts saying some stupid shit. The boss wasn't too happy about this but didn't care enough to say anything until an incident where I hung up on someone who wanted that boneless pizza and he called back pissed because he actually wanted to order. So I get a stern talking to from boss man and he sends a message to the company's group chat up saying, I know we've been getting more prank calls than usual, but please don't follow in certain people's footsteps and just hang up on them. Take the calls as seriously as possible. If they order something we can't make. Calmly explain it to them and offer them something we do actually sell. We want to try to make money off of them even if they're acting dumb. So the very next call is where the fun starts. Thank you for calling. What can I get you? I'm so hungry. Can I get an extra 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 large pizza with triple every topping? I'm sorry mom. We can only go up to one extra and double each topping. Hum okay then. Can I get 20 XLs of each meat you'll have? So like 20 pepperoni. 20 sausage, etc. These people are obviously high as hell and giggling in the background the whole time sure. Give me a sec to ring it all up. Okay so that's 180 pizzas. The total will be $1000. Don't remember the actual price but close enough and it'll take about 3 hours or some thanks. We'll pay with a check when we get their dialed tone. So I place the order. And not 30 seconds later I hear what the actual fuck from the boss and he runs to the computer. How are they paying for this? He asks me. They said with a check, we do still take checks for orders over $200 right? They can't have been serious, was this a prank call not sure boss? You said take all calls seriously. He just grumbles and picks up the phone and calls the customer, and all I hear is super loud laughter as he hangs up. Meanwhile, other employees have started actually making the ridiculous order not noticing anything weird about it. So by the time the boss finishes the call and cancels the order on the computer, there are already 5XL pepperoni pizzas in the oven. So we got free dinner for everyone working that night as well as another message in the group chat up simply saying in regards to my last message, please just use good judgment when taking orders. Thank you. Next. A few years ago, I was teaching at a university in the UK as a grad student, and they switched up their payment system for teaching seminars. The previous system had been that we prepped the seminar, taught the seminar, and were paid for the time it took to do both. We were expected to not be fraudulent in our timesheets, and received a decent level of pay for the work we did, approx £23 slash hour. That rate of pay was pretty cheap compared to faculty, and we often created our own course content, updated old courses, and so on. Quite a few of us actually shortchanged ourselves because... While we did the reading, we weren't expected to and didn't feel right charging for it. Then they changed the system. The university was losing money paying us, and our feedback wasn't top notch. It wasn't going to be. We only had a morning of training before teaching seminars. HR gathered us in a room and told us all that we would now be paid for one hour of prep for every unique hour of seminar, and our pay was dropping to £13 slash hour. I stuck my hand up and asked so if we've prepped for an hour, we should stop prepping, and then just teach what we've got? They conferred at the front of the room, and hesitantly replied yes, I suppose that is what we're saying. Apostrophe. Next day, we had an email sent around by HR. All faculty would now be required to give us sufficient teaching notes so that we would take an hour maximum to prepare for an hour's seminar. Obviously, that didn't happen. As an example, one of the first seminar series I taught under the new structure, my guidance consisted of a brief conversation in passing in the hallway. Without that, I doubt I would have had anything. So, new term, new students. First seminar rolls around, I get through 20 minutes, run out of material, inform the students of the new payment ruling, 
and say they can either grab a coffee with me, or they can leave. Same thing happened in all of my other seminars that week. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that my seminars were not part of the exam material, they were to help with coursework. In the vacated 40 or so minutes of each seminar, I did discuss coursework with the students who stuck around, so I was making sure they weren't losing out. After all, this wasn't their fault, and they shouldn't lose out. After my first round of seminars, I think I'd taught about 60% of the department's students. Some of them found it amusing, some found it irksome, none complained directly to me about my teaching. I'd made it very clear to them who to contact, and they did. I got called into the office, got asked to explain myself. I did, they told me I wasn't to do it again the next week. I asked for more money, to reflect the work I would be doing. They said they would review it. They didn't get back to me before the next round of seminars. So I did the same thing. This repeated for about 6 or 7 rounds of seminars. Each time, the students grew progressively, and expectedly, agitated. Then someone went to a national newspaper. An article was published, profiled a couple of different people, quoted me anonymously a few times, private survey that I responded to, and we were all emailed by HR. There would be no changes, they said. We were all to read a blog they had written, they said. We would all be switched to less secure contracts next year, they said, with a temp agency. We were expected to prepare fully for the hour of teaching we were paid to do, and they anticipated that it would take an hour to prepare for an hour. They would take no questions. Every single one of my students that term got a 2, 1 or higher on their course year walks, 3, 3 GPA or higher for those across the pond and not graded on a curve. I won a couple of teaching awards, from students, not faculty, and finished the term dead chuffed with how my students did. I wasn't offered any teaching the next term, nor were the people who had spoken to the newspaper, or anyone else who had taken the same line that I had. Thank you. Next. Saru this probs ain't the best but was funny as at the time. Also in Sydney to clear the air up folks. So me and the boys wear out at the casino as you do when you're 18 and it's your mate's birthday. I grabbed a beer with one of my mates when this Sheila walks up to me, one of those ugly F ones that wreck and fear hot and force themselves onto blokes, and says I heard men buy pretty girls drinks. Can I have one I said no not often I do and no I won't. She started whinging so I went stuff it I'll buy her a drink. Downed my beer and ordered another, with a shot of water for her. Bartender looks at me with the YTF you order a shot of water look. I gave him a wink. Drinks come out and in my typical smart ass voice say here you go love. Here's your drink. She got the cranks and threw the drink at me and stormed off. Face with tears of joy. Face with tears of joy. Thank you. Next. Let's set the scene. It's 2017. I was in a 3 month internship that turned out to be. Not exactly what I thought it would be. Two other students and I were sent down to work with an environmental group. Before going there, we were given about zero prep, but were told that once we got there the organization would have all the details and everything worked out. So that was a lie. We get there, and immediately it's a huge chore to get them to give us anything to do. They're good people, trying to do good, but they had no idea what to do with us. Several times I go in to meet my supervisor at our designated times and he's just not there. No one knows where he is. I ended up cataloging all the books in their library. It was frustrating, to say the least, to go in every week and beg for them to give us tasks. Towards the end we started giving up, just dealing with the minute plans they do give us. Now the story. We're set to leave in a couple weeks. So our supervisors tell us that we should give short presentations on our work over the past 3 months. Cool. Whatever I can talk about cataloging for 5 minutes. All our work was in Spanish, which is my second language. So I'm being sure when making my PowerPoint that everything is grammatically correct and shit. We go in a week before our presentation and have the following convo. Us. What day should we do the presentation? Supervisor. I think Friday is best. That's when everyone is in the office. Us. What time? Sup. Hum. Not sure. I'll call you before the day. I'm sure you can see where this is going. The days go by. No phone call. Thursday night rolls around and we decide that we're tired of getting jerked around by this organization. 
If they don't call before noon tomorrow, we flew out on Saturday and had to pack and say goodbye to people, we wouldn't go. Well, one of the supervisors finally calls us at 12.30ish, asks why we're not in yet. Sorry boss, you said you'd call before the day. We have early flights, we're not coming in to give our presentations. There wasn't much fallout, our academic advisors back at university were a bit angry with us, but couldn't get us in trouble for anything and we three already had other references. It was a bit shitty, but it felt very liberating. Thanks for reading. Thank you. Next. Not sure if this fits here but here we go. When I was in high school I worked at a pizza parlor. One day a lady had ordered a hot sandwich, we made those too, and decided after one bite that she wanted a slice of pizza instead. She sends her son, who is younger than me, to do the exchange. The kid says he wants a slice of pizza instead and I say sure no problem and begin to cut him a slice. I ring him up and he tries to hand me the sandwich. I look at him and ask what is he doing. He says he is giving me back the sandwich for the slice of pizza. I ask him what's wrong with it and he says nothing. I politely inform him that we cannot do a refund on a partially eaten meal and if he wants the pizza he will be charged for it. He gets this sheepish look on his face and wanders back to his table with the sandwich. Next thing I know the mom is at the register with the sandwich hot about how we won't do the exchange. About this time a co-worker, about the mom's age, overhears and says to her that there will not be a refund, have a nice day. She gets ruffled feathers and wants to know my name and the name of the co-worker as she gets out a pen. I say, sure, my name is and that was, the owner. She stops writing, glares at me and leaves in a half. I smiled. Thank you, next. This was some years ago when I worked for a small restaurant. I started out as a dishwasher and eventually moved to cook slash prep cook. Ended up working there for a couple years. There came a point where during the busy summer months, as a dishwasher still, I would be busting my butt to make sure everything ran as smooth as possible throughout the restaurant. I'd help the servers with their tables. I'd of course clear tables as much as possible. I'd help the kitchen staff restock things as needed, and so on. The dishes of course were the job, but only so far as we could stretch things before closing time, after which the remaining dishes and any other things that needed doing throughout the restaurant would get taken care of. Sometimes this took some time to complete when the restaurant was super busy and things backed up really bad throughout the place. The thing is, though, that while there are customers, serving the customers food to them is the priority. So when push comes to shove, the thing that falls behind the most is always the dishes. My job, this led to a string of days, more than a week, where I was stuck in the restaurant an hour or more after close just getting all the dishes clean for the next day. One day was particularly bad when I was there until 1am, several hours after close. This was partly because it had been a really busy day, but also some customers staying late, and so on. My boss told me the next day, I've noticed you've been closing later and later, and yesterday you closed way past midnight. What's the deal? I need you to close faster. I explained to her how the dishwashing took second place to the priority of serving people food, so the kitchen staff always got my help when they needed it and the serving staff always got my help when they needed it too. However, at the end of the night when the last customer left, the servers would finish resetting the tables and the kitchen staff would finish restocking things for the next morning, and naturally the cleaning that needed doing all around would happen. But then everyone else left and I was stuck there washing dishes on my own with nobody helping me. Well, that's your job, you should be able to handle it. Yes but I help them do their jobs, so at the end of the day when they're finished they should help me with mine. Or else I am going to be here longer and that's just how it is. Alright, well I need you to leave earlier, so figure it out. I did. I did figure it out. The next day, as my manager liked to call it, we were slammer jammer. Crazy busy. Dishes were even more backed up than ever before. At closing time I told the serving staff and kitchen staff that I needed some help cleaning this up because the manager wanted me out of there earlier. They said well, you can manage. And off they went. I decided I'd had enough. I left about 45 minutes worth of dishes uncleaned and took off at the appropriate time I was supposed to be done by. The next morning, the kitchen staff were quite upset because they obviously didn't have things all finished and had to do some extra work to get it clean. My manager called me into the office to have a talk when I arrived later that day. 
So, you left early and left a bunch of stuff dirty in the dish pit. Is this going to be a problem? You told me to leave on time. I did the best I could. The options were, stay later, or leave on time and leave some dirty dishes behind for the morning staff to clean. You can't get those dishes done in that much time. The dishwasher has a limited capacity so that's the limit for some dishes. But pots and pans, things the kitchen uses mostly, can be hand washed more easily. The same is true for some of the serving staff's stuff. In fact a lot of that has to be hand washed regardless. Here's what happens. First the front end gets slammed. Then the kitchen gets slammed making the orders for all those customers. Then the customers leave and the serving staff do their thing and the kitchen starts to catch up. Then the kitchen gets caught up and the serving staff starts heading home. Then the kitchen staff heads home and it's just me in the back still dealing with the original big slam of customers we had earlier in the day. Here's what I can do. I can refuse to help them and 100% focus on making sure dishes are done. That may mean you need to have more serving staff come in to handle the load. Since I won't be helping, that also might might you may need to have the line cooks and slash your prep cooks stay longer to make sure the kitchen is kept up to pace through the busiest hours. If I'm just sticking to clearing tables and washing dishes, I can keep up and maintain everything fine. Okay well do that. The rest of the restaurant didn't last a day before they were demanding my help during their rush times, clearly upset. And it was only a day after that that the manager instructed them they needed to help me with washing dishes and we'd all leave together at the end of the night. They finally started to understand when they tried to help me get those dishes done. It changed everything. I of course returned the favor and all was well. Not long after that I moved over to handling prep work, slicing and dicing and all that kind of thing. I also started handling food deliveries and so on. It was nice and I got paid more, but I found out pretty quick that the faster I did my job, the less I got paid. Unlike with dishes there was a bit more fixed amount of work to do, so I was happy to help the dishwashers. I got so fast at one point that in the middle of summer rush days I'd just hang out in the dish pit, and the dishwasher would have it so easy. The manager tried to have me do both dishwashing and prep work, because otherwise I lost too many hours. But that situation and how I got past it is another, non-malicious compliance, story. D. Thank you. Next. It was many years ago now that I was a locum veterinarian in a small suburban veterinary clinic. For the most part the clients were a pleasure to work with, were receptive to the advice and instructions given to them by the staff in regards to their pets, and it generally made my time working there a placid experience. Every rare once in a while though a client's account would be flagged as non-compliant. This usually meant a client who didn't follow medication instructions, post-operative procedures, scheduled rechecks, general health advice, and so forth, usually resulting in cases not progressing as well as they should have. Of course, some of these clients would also complain about said poor outcome, and the fault was, of course, never theirs. Enter one particular maze. Non-com. Since I was only a part-time locum, working every other weekend at the time at this particular clinic, I seldom saw a client more than once unless they specifically requested to see me again. As such, I had never met Ms. Noncom before, but plastered at the top of her file was the dreaded non-compliant. Ms. Noncom owned a Jack Russell Terrier that had an extensive history with the clinic, and as I browsed the history of the patient prior to the consultation to familiarize myself with them. It was painfully obvious that Jack was far too fat to be healthy. In fact, there was enough of Jack to make another Jack, with some Jack to spare. Jack was due his annual vaccination and checkup, and so I asked them to enter the consultation room, which they did at a leisurely pace due to the fact that Jack was barely able to keep up with Maze. Noncom, who was herself not particularly fast due to her own bodily dimensions. It was somewhat apparent why Jack was struggling with weight issues when his own owner was apparently having the same difficulties. Typically in a situation like this I would be as careful as could be not to offend the owner or make any assumptions about their current bodily state, as it's common for large owners to likewise have large pets, and suggestions have to be made appropriately without blatantly putting too much blame on the owner. However, my desire to be tactful went straight out the window when Ms. Noncom with the sour expression on her face, which also appeared to have the remnants of a candy bar smeared on one cheek, 
heaved her panting Jack onto the table and greeted me with an irritable, Jack needs his needles, and don't tell me my dog is fat. Very well. Jack was only 5 years old, far too young to be the size he was, though no pet of any age should ever be as fat as he was, and his history had revealed a host of maladies that resulted from his size. Abrasive skin damage of his chest and belly from dragging on the ground. Skin fold dermatitis. Recurrent yeast infections of his ear canals that were squeezed shut by a neck that was no longer a neck, but merely a globular extension of his thorax. Degenerative joint disease. Upper airway disease. The list went on. Now unfortunately, one shortcoming of the clinic I worked at was the senior veterinarian there who owned the practice was a very senior fellow indeed who had long lost his passion for the job, and seemed to be content to just let things slide with the more difficult clients, treating the patient symptomatically rather than addressing the underlying problem. I decided that now was the time to assert my new blood. I have a habit that as I gather the history of the patient from the last time they were seen, I dictate it to myself as I type it into the history of the file. This gives the client a chance to correct anything I may have misheard, or add something they remember as I repeat it. And thus I did with Jack, complying with Maze. Noncom's desire that I do not tell her that her dog was fat. The patient at presentation of the consultation is morbidly obese and at weigh in is half a kilo heavier than at last consultation. Presenting with moderate to severe dyspnea likely complicated by excess adipose tissue deposition in and around the thorax. I looked up from my typing. How much are you feeding Jack these days? Ms. Noncom shot me a poisonous look, but perhaps because she hadn't met me before and thought perhaps I hadn't quite heard her entering remark. Responded. He is getting two meals a day what you recommended last time I was here. Should all be in your records there. It certainly was. The amount recommended should have been fine to encourage weight loss even in the face of limited exercise. So I forged on with my history writing. Patient is consuming recommended diet but has failed to shed any excess body mass since last seen 5 months ago. Another sideways glance from Ms. Nonkin, and this time her cheeks flushed a little. I proceeded with the physical exam of the patient, and with each problem I noted as a result of his being overweight, I used a different synonym. Hefty, rotund, enlarged, bloated, and a variety of other fat but not fat words were used as I typed up the findings, and in my peripheral vision I could see Ms. Noncom's complexion slowly turn from pink, to tomato, to beetroot. It was when I reached the point of Jack carrying a lot of weight to the opera that she exploded. How dare you. I told you not to tell Emmy he's fat there's nothing I can do about IT so stop telling Emmy. I mustered my most pained look I could manage. But mom, I never once used the word you explicitly told me not to use. And as for there being nothing that can be done, the history states you've refused testing to determine if he has thyroid, adrenal, or other disease that may be complicating his weight loss. This really isn't in his best interests. If money is an issue, we do have payment plans that can help spread out the cost of such testing. I didn't get to finish, as Ms. Noncom scooped Jack off the table, berating me and the entire staff of the clinic as she rumbled her person out of the clinic as fast as she could, and swearing that my boss would hear about this. No sooner had the door shut I heard the nursing staff burst out giggling, and my boss poked his head out of the adjoining consult room where I'm sure he'd heard the entire exchange. He simply sighed, shrugged, and said, well, I didn't hear you say the word fat once, before closing the door.